So what did you want to talk to me about, honey? Okay, hear me out. I've got the opportunity of a lifetime. Okay, so you remember Doug, right? You love Doug. Oh, well, yeah, well, you, you didn't hate Doug. Anyway, that's not the point. Oh, I remember Doug. Okay, so it's one of those vacation ownership properties in Florida. Doug just went in on it and he wants us to get in on it too. Nobody ever regrets these things. I know that it might seem like a lot of money, but Doug says that they've almost got control of the snake situation and the swampland is about to dry out in a year or so. This is a steal of a deal. Oh. Well, we had to use all our retirement money again. Oh, Frank, it was that darn vacation property, wasn't it? We just can't get out of the contract. How was I supposed to know that the property would just sink? I just couldn't say no. You looked so excited. That darn Doug, I'll find you one day. <laughs> I just wish I could retire. My back, my back. Okay, so I know there's rumors that the plant life has been salted, but Doug says that that is not true. What do you say? Sometimes you just have to say, no. or you might regret it for the rest of your life. We, we are in the last week of this series talking about how no is a beautiful word, but it is a beautiful word when it, when it releases us to be able to say yes to what's best, to what God wants for us. And sometimes we're saying no to bad things, sometimes we're saying no to neutral things, but sometimes we're saying no to good things. But there's better yeses, and we've used this image each week, and so I'll use it one more time, that you're standing at a buffet, and you get halfway down, your plate's overloaded, and, and, and in life, if your plate starts to get overloaded, your schedule is full, your margin is paper thin, you have no room for anything else, but you slide something onto your plate of your life, can't you help with this, can't you do that, wouldn't you sign up for this, and you slide one more thing on, something falls off. And we've learned that when your plate is full in your life, every yes is a no because your plate's full. And when you say yes to one thing, something else isn't going to be able to be done well anymore. And oftentimes that's our, our health, our children, our grandchildren, our spouses, our spiritual life. Sometimes the most important things roll off of our plate. Every yes is truly a no. Uh, we had a devotional time this morning where one of our volunteers on the worship team led us just over here in the hallway before the service, led us in the devotional, and it was really neat. She said, you know, one of my takeaways from these last couple of weeks is this idea that every yes is a no. And she said, what I realized was that every night when I go to bed, I get in bed, and she said, I say yes to spending about 25 to 30 minutes on Instagram. I just go on my phone and I just check all my things. And she said, I've been saying every single night, that's a routine in my life, I say yes to that. But I started thinking, what am I saying no to? Like maybe sleep? At that moment, I'm saying no to other things I could be doing. And she said, I, de I decided I'm going to actually say no to my late night Instagram to say yes to something else. And her new yes was to actually open up her phone to her Bible app and read God's word before she goes to bed. And she said, it's really impacted her life in a wonderful way. Every yes is a no, but also every no, when our plate is full and we take something off, is a yes to the right things. And then we talked about last week the reality that we have to know our no's. I need to know how to say no because we, all, we almost all say, I'm just not good. I don't like looking at somebody saying no, but how do I say no in a way that frees me to say yes to the things that matter most? And today we're going to talk about epic no's, big epic no's, and also the joy of being able to say yes to the things that matter the most. And one epic no, and I, and I use this term, let me explain what it means. One epic no is what I call no morality. You say, what's no morality? Well, it's, it's two things. One, it's the way our world thinks today that there's no morality. And some people even believe there isn't any moral boundaries for anything. But what I'm talking about is saying no so we can live a moral life. No morality is learning that we have to say no to some things to say yes to the things that God says lead to the right, beautiful, good, moral life that our hearts long for, that God longs for us, but oftentimes we miss out on. And so God actually puts up signs 
that say no to this or no to that. If you have your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 20. We'll get to that in just a minute. If you have your Bible app, you can open to Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to look at some of these epic no's, these, these, these no morality. But I was thinking about um, years ago, I had a chance to go to France. Uh, myself and a team of people and Sherry went over there to do ministry with a group called Christian Associates International. And they said, hey, when you come over here to do ministry, stay for a couple days and you can go skiing because they said where we are is right next to the French Alps. So you go skiing or snowboarding for a couple days. And so we said yes uh, to that. <laughs> Brought our stuff along. <clears throat> so one day I was up and I was, I was skiing and boarding with these two guys. They were good friends of mine and they were musicians and we were doing ministry together. And, and so we got to the very top of one of the Alps and there was beautiful snow going this way and there's beautiful snow going that way. And we're deciding which way to ski. And going this way over the back, there were all these signs. Apparently, there were warning signs, but they were in some kind of foreign language. Uh, they weren't thinking about us Americans at that point. So we didn't know what they said. So we looked and thought the snow was better that way. So we didn't ignore the signs. We just didn't know what they said. So off we went down that side of the mountain. And the snow was incredible. It was amazing. And, and we're skiing down and boarding down. We're having a great time. We were thinking, this is amazing. There's nobody on the side of the mountain. <laughs> so we're flying, we're flying down. And, just, and then we noticed that the chairlifts aren't moving. And then we noticed that the snow stopped. It was gone. It was the sunny side of the mountain. And these, we found out later these signs said, the mountain's closed. Don't go this way. So sometimes signs are posted to help us. No, don't go this way. Because, so we literally had to take, I took my board off. They took their skis off, put them over our shoulders. We hiked like an hour and a half down the mountain in ski boots. That's comfortable. I had to find people that would speak some English and get them to shuttle us back to the other side of the mountain. Missing what the signs are saying is oftentimes a very bad idea. And what God has done in Exodus chapter 20 is God has posted these signs, and some of the signs are, are, are these signs that are clear, strong, no. And with every no, there's also a yes. God's saying no for a reason. And, and it's kind of exciting. These, these 10 commandments, and, and, and 10 of them are, are, eight of the 10 say directly, no, thou shall not, don't do this. One is a remember the Sabbath day, and one is to honor your parents. But all of them have a no, and all of them have a yes. We're going to dig into these 10 amazing signs that will lead us toward a moral life and the best kind of life this summer. We're going to do a Sunday this summer, one week every Sunday on each Sunday at each of the 10 commandments. And it's going to be a powerful series digging into why is God saying no out of love to lead us to a better yes. But here's a little foretaste of this, this no morality, saying no so we can live a moral life. In verse 3, God says, you shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. Why? Because God is saying, say yes to me. I am the one true creator, the lover of your soul. Don't follow false gods when you can follow the real thing. The next thing, verse 4, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in the heaven above, the earth beneath, the waters below. No images, no idols. In the ancient world, they would build these little stone or metal or wooden idols, and they would literally bow down and say, that's my God. They'd pick it up and carry it when they were traveling and put it on their, put it on their shelf. There's my God, carrying your own God around. And God says, no idols, why? Because he says, I'm a living God. I'm not made with stone or wood. God wants us to experience him fully. Here's the third one. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Don't misuse his name. In the ancient world, they knew that there was meaning and power in the name. And God's name, to misuse God's name, is really saying, honor my name, honor my character, honor who I am. Say no to misusing my name so you can say yes to honoring who I am. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Well, there's a no here. You know what it is? No work one day a week. Now, we just get on our skis and head right over the hill and go past that one all the time. But there's a reason that God is saying, one day a week, no work. In the rhythm of life, we weren't made to be working all the time. We're made for a rhythm of work and rest. And we'll, again, we'll look at that more this summer. Those first four commandments deal with how we relate to God this way. And God says, I'm giving you boundaries because I love you. I'm saying no, because on that side of the mountain, it's not safe, it's not good, it's not the best way to go. Stay where I'm calling, and he's calling us to a better yes. Then the next six of the Ten Commandments are about how we relate to each other. The first four are relating to God. The next six are relating to each other. And so the next one in verse 12 says, honor your father and your mother. Honor your parents. That's the call, to no disrespect. And, and the Bible talks a lot about the importance of honoring parents. And I think that's the lead into honoring people as a whole. If we can't honor our parents, how are we going to honor anybody else? And then it kind of starts to be the lightning around, rapid fire. It goes really fast. You shall not murder. 
You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. I mean, that's the entire thing. Just boom, 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 boom. And you shall not covet your neighbor's house or their wife or their, you know, it says you shouldn't look at somebody else's life and say, I want her life. I want his life. I want what they have. But in every one of these no's, you shall not murder. God is saying, say yes to the goodness of life. From beginning to end, God loves life. So should we. You shall not commit adultery. He's saying yes to faithfulness. And yes to, yes to sexual purity in a world where it says there's no boundaries. We're going to look at that this summer. You, should, you shall not steal, but saying yes to protecting what other people have and honoring people and the things that they have. You shall not get bar, bear false testimony against your neighbor. You should speak the truth. And people should know you'll speak the truth. You shall not covet. Man, when we spend all of our time looking at what everybody else has and wanting what they have, here's what we forget. Look what God's given me. Because there's always stuff other people have that we could like more than what we have. But God says, don't focus there. Focus here. No morality is deciding this. There are things I will say no to so I can live a life that honors God. Because God gives the boundaries. Well, in our world where people say, well, there is no morality. God says, oh, there is. And God establishes what a moral life is. And we should want to live a life that honors God, that looks like the life that God wants for us. And so we're going to dig into that this summer. But I want to ask you right now this question. You'll see it up on the screen. What big no do you need to say to live a more moral and God-honoring life? Just a, a moment of quiet. Say, is there, is there one thing I have to start saying no to because I know I'm not living the kind of moral life, the right, good, pure life that God has. And just let God speak to you for a moment. Say, God, is there an area I need to say no so I can live a more moral life? God, give us the courage to say no so that we can live a life that honors you. Here's another kind of no. I call this automatic no. An automatic no is when you're on autopilot. You have decided in advance. When that happens, when that presents itself, I'm saying no. And you think about, you're going to know your no's. I'm going to even think about how I'm going to say no when that happens because I'm going to probably get that invitation, that opportunity lots of times. And some of the automatic no's, listen closely, are not necessarily morally wrong or even wrong for everyone. It might just be wrong for you. And so you talk to God about it. You say, God, is there something I should say no to? You want to you hear one of, my, one of my automatic no's? Here's how it goes. And this has happened thousands of times. Kevin, would you like a glass of wine or would you like a beer? I said, oh, no, thanks. I just wrote real quick, no, thanks. I don't give a lot of explanations. No, no, thanks. And it goes back to when I was 13 years old, before I was a Christian, before I was a pastor. When my dad's mother, my granny, sat me down and explained that my dad was an alcoholic, that her first husband, my grandpa, who I never met, died, literally found him in a gutter, dead in New York City as a drunk, and his father died because of alcohol-related issues. So she said, will you promise me that you will never drink and be the fourth generation of alcoholics in our family? I said, granny, I can't promise you that because I've already started drinking. I was 13. She said, will you promise you'll never drink again? And I said, I promise. Again, it wasn't a moral choice. It wasn't a, I wasn't a Christian. I just looked at my granny. I loved her, and I looked at my family history, and I said, I'll never drink again. So when one of my son's weddings, when they cracked open a really expensive, one of the nicest I, I hear, one of the nicest bottles in the history of the world, bottles of wine, Kevin, would you like a sip? I said, no, thanks. Why could I do that? Because I said it thousands of times before, and I'll say it a thousand more times before I die if the Lord gives me years. It's, now, could somebody else say, oh, sure, I'd love a taste of that. I'd love it. That's, that's not a moral right or wrong having a sip of wine. But for me... It's an automatic no. You get the picture? You have to look and say, in my life, what are my automatic no's? Here's some, just some thoughts, some rapid fire thoughts. Maybe this one. When someone starts gossiping and talking about somebody who isn't there, I say no to getting involved. And sometimes maybe I have to say no to even staying in the conversation. I might even have the courage to say, you know, that person's not here right now. We probably shouldn't be talking about them. Or have you talked to them about that? But I'm going to say no to gossip. Can young people in our culture, and even grown up older people, Say no to all the sexual temptations that are out there. Our culture now, now basically says, well, no, you don't say no. You say yes to everything. I mean, it's your life and you do what you want. Enjoy yourself, have fun. That's, it's all about what pleases you. But can, it, can the next generation of people in this generation say, I'm going to say no to certain temptations sexually because I want to honor God with my life? Yes, we can. We believe in the power of a God who can give us strength to say no. 
but we make decisions in advance. Here's what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna say no. And people almost laugh at that today, but we shouldn't, because God says, I have a best life planned for you. And you're away on business. And people ask this question, late, late in the evening after all the meetings are done, dinner's done, hey, you wanna go out for late night drinks? And you think, it seems like every time I go out for late night drinks, just good things don't come of it. Ah, no thanks, I'm calling it a night. I know people that have made that decision. They don't do the kind of after hour, after hour stuff because they find themselves making choices that they probably shouldn't make. But they decide in advance what they're gonna do. I, I heard a guy speaking at a conference, he was in his 70s, and this guy said, I have made a decision. When I, he said, I travel 40 to 50 times a year, so almost every week I'm in some hotel somewhere. Usually I'm by myself. He said, I've made a decision. I won't turn the TV on. He said, here's the reason why. This guy in his 70s, here's the reason why. Many of these TVs have free or for pay pornography. And he said, I still struggle with pornography. I'm thinking, you're in your 70s. Still a problem? And he's going, it is. He said, so here's what I do. He says, this is what I do. I walk in my hotel room. I go right to the bathroom. And I get a towel. And if it's a giant TV, I get two towels. And I put the towels over the TV covering the screen. This, this, this guy's telling me, telling the whole group this. And he says, and then I go to my suitcase and I always carry a giant picture of my wife. He says, I set that right in front of the TV, in front of the towels there where my wife's smiling at me <laughs> and I don't touch the TV the whole time. He says, that's his automatic no. But he said, then it's not a temptation for me. That's his, uh, some of you are like, man, I, I, I can sit and watch some sports. I won't be tempted by that. Fine. But for him, he needs that automatic no. How about this one? I haven't made this decision yet, but I'm, I'm thinking, I'm pondering this one. When you're at a restaurant and they say, oh, can, we, can I give you, can, would you like to look at a dessert menu? <laughs> if I say yes to looking at it, all is lost. If it has like something like, like melty chocolate and vanilla ice cream, I'd be excited just talking about it. Um, <laughs> it's over, you know? But if I, if I were to say, oh, no, thank you, and not look at it, I, you know, I don't know what it is for you, but again, let's just quiet our hearts for a minute. And say, Lord, is there one or two automatic no's that you want for me, that I need for me? And just let God speak to your heart. And if he does, prepare to be responsive. And then practice saying no. Is there an automatic no for me, Lord? Lord, I know that there's automatic no's that I've said hundreds of times. Just decide in advance. And I pray for each of us that if there's no's that we should speak just on autopilot, speak to us, challenge us, give us the right way to say no, and let it become just like breathing, just like life, and let us resist and avoid things that you don't want for our lives so we can say yes to what you want for us. Okay, here's another no. No honesty. You're saying, well, no honesty, don't, shouldn't we be honest? No, the whole point is sometimes we have to say no to be honest about things. We have to say no to the lies that come our way. Sometimes we aren't being honest with ourselves because we're hearing lies from our own mind, from our family, from our past, or from the pit of hell. Can I say? The, the Bible, Jesus says, Jesus says in John 8, that the devil, your enemy, is a liar and the father of lies, and when he lies, he speaks his native language. The best liar in the history of all the universe is Satan. And he whispers lies to us. And we have to say, no, that is a lie from the pit of hell. Or no, that's a lie from my own mind. Or no, that's a lie from my parents that they taught me that, but that's not true. And I'm going to say yes to the honesty of hearing what God has to say. I'm going to say yes to God's word when the world lies and says it isn't true. I'm going to say yes to God's ways when I myself sometimes lie and say it's not a big deal. No honesty is saying no to the lies so we can say yes to the truth and follow what God has for us. And, and that's what we need to learn to do. I, I think about this when, uh, I've shared this before, but my family came out of a non-church home and a non-believing home. And one by one, all the kids in our, the five kids in my family became Christians. And the last one, my last sister, who wasn't a Christian yet, the day that she became a Christian, I was sitting and talking with her and she was, she was really open to Christ. She was going to church. She was learning about Jesus. She was reading the Bible. But she hadn't said yes to Jesus yet. And I said to her, what's standing in the way? What's keeping you from saying yes to Jesus? And here's what she said. She said, 
I'm afraid. Here's what she said. She said, I know. She said, I've been going to church, and I've been reading the Bible. I know that when anybody confesses all their wrongs to Jesus, he forgives them. I know he washes them clean. She said, I know, I know that he died on the cross. She went through the whole story of Jesus dying on the cross and rising to pay the price. She said, I know that whenever somebody confesses their sins, he forgives them. And this is what my sister said to me. She said, but I'm, I just wonder, what if I'm the first person that Jesus says no to? She really said that to me. Where's that coming from? That's coming from the pit of hell. That's a lie from the enemy. And so I said, let me, be, let me tell you the honest truth, Allie. Here's the truth. You know, when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's the truth. His arms are open and he's waiting for you. She had to say no to the lies so she could hear the truth of God. And we have to learn to say no to the lies of the enemy. How about this lie? I'm fine just the way I am. God has so much more for you than you imagine or dream. Does God love you where you are today? Absolutely. Does he want more for you than you have today? What's the answer? Yes. So those little lies that come in from ourselves, I could never change. I could never overcome this. You know, I've tried to overcome that sin. I tried to reject that behavior, and I just, don't, I just will never overcome that. Say, no, he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. And I walk in the victory and the conquering power of Jesus Christ. And the very, the very power that rose Jesus from the dead dwells in me as a Christian. I can overcome this in the power of Jesus. Not in my power, but in the power of Jesus. That's the truth. So no to the lie so I can say yes to the truth. You want to know a lie I've heard twice in the last couple of weeks? In two different situations? People that are going through incredible struggling and pain and heartache. You know, in, in both cases, the most difficult experience of their lives. But both of them are committed Christians. And here's what's going through their mind. Maybe I'm going through this because God's punishing me. Maybe because of the way I lived when I was in college and the choices I made there. Maybe God's punishing me for that. Maybe because I was doing this recently, God's punishing me. But, but in both cases, their hearts are with Jesus. They've confessed their sins. Now, here's the question. Is there punishment for sin for our wrongs? Here's the answer. Yes. That's why Jesus died on the cross. So when a Christian has come to the cross and received Jesus Christ, all the punishment, all the judgment, all the payment for their sin was placed on Jesus and he took the punishment, he paid the price, he threw it in the deepest sea and he said, it is finished, it's paid. That's the truth. See, no honesty is saying no to the lie so we can hear what God is saying to us and understand the truth. We have to walk and live in that truth. Now, here's another question. Are there sometimes consequences for dumb choices we made or sins we committed in the past? The answer is yes. So for somebody to say, I might be living with some of the consequences of how I lived and what I chose, that's, that's fair. But is God intentionally judging me and punishing me? No, that punishment, that judgment Jesus took and that's taken care of. Someone say amen. amen. And that's the truth. See, no honesty is saying, I will identify the lies of the enemy and I will speak the truth. Ephesians 4.15 says this. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church and he says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. We become mature in who God wants us to be when we speak the truth in love. So here's what I want to do. I want to pause again and I want you just to think, are there lies that I'm believing? Lies about me, lies about God. That I need to say, that's not true. And the best way to know what is true is to know this book. This is why every week, year round, every day of the year, there's a one day reading plan in, on our website and your, your bulletin every single week to get you ready for next week's sermon, to give you a place to read this book because as you get to know this book, you know the truth and the truth sets you free. When you meet Jesus, you meet the truth and the truth sets you free. So just quiet your heart again and ask the question, Lord, are there lies I'm telling myself, the enemy is telling me, culture is telling me that I need to say no to and speak the truth? Just have a quiet, quiet moment with the Lord. Lord Jesus, you are the truth. And the liar and the father of lies is whispering all kinds of garbage to us. I pray that we would be able to say no to the lies and yes to a life that honors you. Yes to the truth of your word. Yes to who you say we are and what you call us to do and all you want us to be. Thank you, Jesus, that you come and bring truth in the midst of a very confusing world.
let your truth overcome our own lies, the lies of our family, the lies of our life history, the lies of the enemy, and speak your truth to us. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. And one more thought today. It's what I call God, yes. How do we say yes to God? How do we say God, yes to your plan? God, yes to your will? God, yes to your leading? Because God has the best life beyond what we can imagine or dream. Listen closely. God doesn't promise the easiest life, all right? But he promises the best life. Because to live for him and to follow him is the best way to live. And it will transform every relationship. It'll transform your financial life. It'll, tra it'll transform your emotional life. It'll transform everything about you if you can know what God speaks and says and follow it. And so we say yes to God. And I love this little part of the Lord's Prayer from Matthew chapter six, where Jesus is teaching his followers how to pray. And he says this. This then is how you should pray. This is Matthew 6, 9. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Listen to this. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Your will be done. Say that with me. You ready? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. That's yes, God. That is God. Yes. That is a life that says your kingdom come. Your will be done in my life, in my home, in my workplace at my school, when I'm driving my car. From Monday to Friday, on Friday night and Saturday, your will be done. On Sunday, your will be done. When I'm feeling great and perky and saucy and energized, your will be done. And when I'm feeling down and discouraged and tired and weary and depressed, your will be done. This is a lifestyle that says yes to God because of his love, because of his power, because of his presence, because of his goodness. And as we say yes to God, what, we, what we happens is, is we begin to take some things off our plate, things that shouldn't be there, and we say, I want to make my life available to live for God. That changes everything. And, and here's the journey of faith in God. There's a first yes, when you say yes to Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross, he rose again, he loves you, and you accept him. There's the first yes, and then there's all the yeses after that that just keep aligning you with what he wants for you. The first yes is a yes to the simple story of Jesus. And, and that, that story is so simple, it's almost, it's almost profound in its simplicity. And here's that simple story. There is a God who made us and who loves us. The God of the universe loves you. Whether you know him or believe in him or not, the God of the universe loves you. The story of God begins with God's love for us, for God so loved the world. For it was God who loved us, not we who loved him. God's love. And then that story continues, and we discover that for us, we have a problem. We become separate from God and separate from God's love because we made choices to do things we shouldn't do, think things we shouldn't think, say things we shouldn't say. The Bible calls it sin. But it's anything we do that isn't pleasing to God and that we know isn't the right thing to do, that, that separates us from God. So God loves us. We're separate from God because of our sins, because of our wrongs, and we can't fix that. But God left the glory of heaven and came to earth to solve our problem, that separation of sin. When I was growing up, I thought Christmas was Santa Claus, chocolate, and presents. In my home, we didn't talk about Jesus at all at Christmas. When I became a Christian, I found out that Christmas is about God leaving heaven and being born in a manger. God with us, Emmanuel. Jesus living a perfect life with no sin and no wrong. And him being nailed to a cross for our sins, to pay for our punishment and all of our wrongs. And all the judgment we deserved, all the punishment we deserved, and all the separation we experienced, it was washed away in Jesus Christ on the cross. And he said, it's finished, it's paid, it's done. That's amazing. And there's only one more part to that story. And it's a word. That word is either yes or no. It's either God, yes. I accept Jesus. I accept his, his payment and the price he paid and I accept his love. God, yes to you, to your love, to the gift of Jesus and yes to taking the hand of Jesus now and walking with him all the days of my life. Say Jesus is the one who saves me and cleanses me, brings me back to the Father and Jesus is the one who takes my hand and leads me all the days of my life. And I just keep saying yes to him all the days until I see him face to face. Or we say no. And God doesn't force us with that decision. 
And so I want to go to prayer. And I want to invite you to pray in one of three ways. I, there's a prayer here for each of you. So as I lead us in prayer, you can determine which one's for you. Let's pray together. Hmm. First, for those of you, and just, just let's just quiet our hearts and, and just, just come before the Lord. And for those of you that have come to the cross and you received Jesus, you said yes to Jesus. You might have been, might have been eight years old or 88 years old, but you said yes to Jesus. You confessed your wrongs. You received his forgiveness and his grace. And you said, Jesus, I accept your forgiveness for all my wrongs, and I take your hand and I follow you all the days of my life. If you've done that, all right, and you want to right now say this word, yes, to live more for Jesus. You're saved. You belong to him. If you've done that, you belong to him. But you want to say more yeses to following Jesus. I'm going to ask you just to, to slip your hand up in the air and just raise your hand and say, I want to say, Jesus, I know you love me. I know you died for me. I've accepted you. But right now what I'm saying is, I want to say yes more to you. Yes in my home. Yes in my marriage. Yes to my family. Yes to how I live with my friends. Just raise your hand. Lord Jesus, for those that have their hands up right now, we lift our hands to you and we say, yes, Jesus. May we, may we say yes every moment of every day. Where we've been saying no to you, let us, re let us repent and turn from that and get back in line with saying yes to you. Where we need to get some automatic no so we can say yes to you, let us do that. But we just raise our hand right now and we say, oh God, help me say yes. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you for saving me, cleansing me. But now I pray, give me power to say yes every moment of every day. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in my life as it is in heaven. For the glory of Jesus. He hears that prayer. Go ahead and put your hands down. He hears that prayer. Let's just keep praying. Keep your, your heads bowed and your hearts in a place of prayer. If you're here today, whether you're in the family worship venue, we normally have about 200 people online, so if you're online right now in your living room or in a hotel room or right here in the worship center, I want to lead you in a prayer. If you want to say, yes, God, yes to Jesus for the first time, you might have been coming to Shoreline for two weeks or for 20 years. But right now you want to say for the first time, I'm saying yes to Jesus. Yes to accepting his forgiveness, his love, his grace, and yes to taking his hand and just walking with him through the rest of my life. If you're ready to say yes to Jesus for the first time, will you raise your hand and raise it high? I just want to pray for you. So just raise your hand. If you're ready to say yes to Jesus. Okay. Okay, up here in the balcony. All right. Anybody else, just raise your hand high. Say, I want to say, okay, over here in the middle part of the balcony. Thank you. Anybody else? In the family worship venue, raise your hand and look up. There's a pastor there, right there in the front that just raise your hand in there. And online, you can raise your hand wherever you are. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And I don't, uh, I don't linger real long. All the way again on the far right of the building over here. Yeah, with your hand along the wall. Great. I see your hand. Good. Anybody else? If I don't see your hand, God sees your hand. That's what matters the most. So let's join our hearts together in praying for all those folks raising their hands in the worship center, family worship venue, and online. Would you just pray this prayer? Dear God, yes. Yes to Jesus. Yes to your love. Yes to giving all my sins to Jesus on the cross. And yes to receiving all his forgiveness and all of his love. Yes, to confessing all my wrongs. And yes, to now taking the hand of Jesus and walking with him all the days of my life. Yes, Jesus. And if you prayed that prayer, he hears you. And he's washed your, your sins away. And if you're online right now and you prayed that prayer, will you send a note in online right now? Pastor Ben will respond to you and respond to that note. If you're in the family worship venue, will you talk with the pastor right after the service who's up front there and they want to give you, he wants to give you a Bible? and a 50-day reading plan, and just talk about next steps. And if you're in the worship center, those of you that raised your hands in here, just come forward and meet with Sherry and I. And I want to just talk with you and pray with you, and Sherry wants to share a few things, and we want to help you get started in your journey with Jesus. And one more prayer. If you're in this room right here, in the worship center, in the family worship venue, or online, and you say, I'm just not ready to say yes to Jesus yet, but I will say yes to learning more about Jesus. I want to continue learning more about Jesus and discovering what it means to follow him. If that's you, say, I want to take next steps. I want to ask you, your action of raising your hand is this. When the service is over, 
either online, tell us, I want to join the Perspectives group, or in the family worship venue, or in here, go to the Connections counter and say, can you sign me up for the Perspectives group? And they're starting a seven-week walk through seven questions that anybody who's exploring the Christian faith wants to have answered. And that's a group of people that you can ask the hard questions and grapple with. We want to be a church that journeys with you toward Jesus. It doesn't force you to take the step now if you're not ready, but walks with you towards Jesus. Or call the church during the week and say, tell me about perspectives, and we're going to get you connected to a group of people that want to walk with you. So let me pray for you now. Lord, for those people who aren't ready yet to take that step into your arms, Lord, will you remind them that your arms are still wide open and you love them. You're waiting for that moment. But also remind them that they have people here at Shoreline that will walk with them, that will love them, that will answer their hard questions or, or research with them and figure stuff out. Let them know that we are on a journey together and that this is their church and they're welcome here on their journey towards you, Jesus. And Jesus, for all of us, thank you that you give us the power to say no to things so we can say yes to what matters most. May we say no with wisdom and strength and say yes to what matters most. And we pray this will become a lifestyle for us of wisdom, following you every step in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen.